Oh, that's well. First of all, congratulations on 15 years, uh, Alligator Records. Well, thank you. It it has gone by in a lot less than what seems like 50 years. You know, uh, May 24th was the anniversary of the first Hound Dog Taylor recording session, and I can remember it like it happened last week. You know, it was so it's so vivid in my mind. Yeah, I, I, I'm just went to the internet and see what happened in the past that you were a 23 year old guy. And uh, unfortunately, you know, was uh, Bob Custer from Denmark hired you? Yes, you, you know, you, Bob, you said, I have a good guy to record an album. And he said, We don't take him. Then I do it myself. Well, Bob, Bob had seen Hound Dog Taylor sitting in, you know, at jam sessions at Blue Monday parties. And sitting in, it was often a disaster for Hound Dog. Um, he, other musicians couldn't follow him. They didn't understand his rhythm. And so very often the songs would fall apart. The first time I saw him, in fact, was in exactly that situation on a, in a club on the West Side in 1969. Uh, and none of the songs was, was finished. So I thought he was kind of uh, this lovable guy. Uh, you know, he made everybody laugh. And that they allowed him to sit in and do one or two songs because they liked him so much, not so much because they thought he was a good musician. Then I saw him with his own band and it was a revelation. It was, it was my life opened up and, and I heard how these three musicians made this wonderful, happy music together. This, what I call a glorious racket. Uh, <laughs> it was it was, they were playing as loud as their amplifiers could because they had no PA system and on cheap guitars and cheap amplifiers. So there was a lot of distortion, which was part of their sound. And Hound Dog singing on top of this with a microphone plugged into a guitar amplifier because again, no PA system. And the energy was so amazing and they were having an immense amount of fun. It was, it was really like watching three little kids pretending to be musicians. Uh, and they played for hours and hours and people danced. Even I could dance and I can't dance at all, but <laughs> I could dance to Hound Dog Taylor. And, and it was just, it, it wasn't sad blues at all. It was happy blues. Yeah. I heard that term before, but wasn't it difficult because you were um, seen in life. You could see what he could do with an audience in a life and then um, translate that to an album. Well, that's a good question. That's always been an issue with the blues because the blues is created by the interaction between the musicians and the audience. It's not just the musicians performing the music, it's feeling the reactions and the feedback from the audience and the emotions from the audience and, and changing the song sometimes to work with that particular audience that particular day or night. When I recorded Hound Dog, we set them up just like they played in the club. There were, there were no barriers between them. We didn't worry about microphone leakage because we were mixing it as we went. Yeah. There was no coming back. There was no isolation on anything. Everything was recorded completely live in the studio. They brought the same amplifiers. Hound Dog's amplifier, it had six speakers and two of them were, were cracked. <laughs> so they had extra distortion. And his guitar was a Japanese guitar at the time when made in Japan meant very cheap. Uh, it was probably a $50 guitar. <laughs> so and he turned it up all the way and it distorted. And then I didn't want them to feel hampered by having headphones. So instead of headphones, I set up speakers coming back at them like stage monitors so that they could move around without feeling tied by the, the, the cord, the electrical cord to the headphones. So, and then I had Hound Dog's microphone so close to him, just the way he, he played sitting down. So his, his amplifier was leaking into his microphone. Yeah. And you can actually hear when he leans forward to sing, the sound of the amplifier changes because he's, he's blocking the amplifier sound from coming into the vocal microphone. And, and then we just did all the songs. I had a list with my co-producer, Wesley Race, of every song we had ever heard him perform live. And we just did maybe one or two takes of the song. And I knew they'd be bored if they, if they had to do the same song over and over. So we just went on to the next okay. song. And then, then we came back a week later, did the same thing again. And 
we chose the best takes. But Hound Dog surprised us because we thought we knew every song he ever performed. <laughs> and during the course of those sessions, he recorded three songs we had never heard him do before. And we used them all on the first album. Yeah, I remember my interest in the blues came late 80s. And in the early 90s, I got hold of an album that was 20 years of Alligator Records. Mm -hmm. And the first song on that album was A Hound Dog Tale of a Gimme Back Brown Rig, which is surprisingly the first song on the 50 Years album now. Well, it was his the, the song that the audience liked best of all his songs. So it became sort of his most requested, his theme song. So I, I had to start with that, even though it had also been on the 20 year collection, uh, because it was his most recognizable song and it captured his spirit so well. It is the, 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 the guitar sound, that short sound in it, what what what's makes him stand out to somebody else. Sure, and also, of course, Brewer Phillips, the other guitar player, was playing the bass lines on a guitar, not on a bass. So he could play very fast. And every verse, his, his lines changed. He didn't stay with one bass pattern like most bass players do. So it was all very spontaneous. I read in the bio on the um, Alligator Records website that you were in the, in the beginning, it was one record a year. and That's all I could afford. Yeah, uh, that, that, you know, I, I see. Was that yeah. livable? Could you earn a, 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 an income <laughs> from that? <laughs> Barely. Um, I was I was operating from a, a one room apartment in a very bad part of the city, sleeping on a mattress on the floor, and <laughs> my closet was my warehouse. Uh, and I was very happy on the days when the elevator in the building worked because it was all LPs <sighs> and they were very heavy. So otherwise, I had to carry them up and down four flights of stairs. And Chicago so, was known for uh, harsh winters and hot summers. Yes. Uh, well, I released that first record in August. And uh, it was, I was able to sell some of it before, before the winter got too cold. <laughs> But it was, it was a big struggle. I had to sell enough of the first record to record the second album with Big Walter Horton and Carrie Bell, enough of that record to record the third record with Sun Seals. And then I came back to record Hound Dog again, partly because I wasn't selling enough of Big Walter and Sun Seals for the company to survive. You know, my original vision was there were so many great musicians in Chicago that I thought I'll do one album with each. It'll, yeah. it'll be a lifetime job. I never anticipated doing a second record with Hound Dog, but by the time uh, of, of the second record, Natural Boogie, which we're just releasing on LP again, by the way, um, it, it was obvious that he was my, my star as much as you can be a star in the blues. So he was uh, uh, the guy who was selling enough records to allow me to record somebody unknown like Sun Seals. How was it for you when you received the first Grammy That was Coco Taylor, if I'm rightly informed. I think if you well, struggled actually, all those... Actually, with Coco, it was a Grammy nomination. It wasn't nomination. a Grammy. Okay. Right. Well, it, it was more exciting, actually, for her. Uh, <laughs> but for both of us, it was a validation uh, yeah. of what we were doing. Uh, it made us feel as though we had some sort of level of legitimacy. But mostly, what made me feel good was not so much awards as being in the audience, When I was in the audience, whether it was Hound Dog or Coco or Sun Seals or Fenton Robinson, uh, and the audience was yelling and applauding and feeling the music, that made me feel I was doing the right job in my life. I think um, if you think you do the right job, that's why you kept it so long. Because I heard that you one record a year, sleeping on the ground. You have to be, I had to have a love for the blues music too to grow into what it is now. Well, sure. I, but also I had a mission because I was seeing, you know, I was, I was going to the clubs on the South side and the West side of Chicago in, in always in black neighborhoods at that time, three or four nights a week. So I was seeing all this wonderful music and my, my boss, Bob Kester was recording some of it and almost nobody else was. So I saw that I had a mission. I had a job. And the music was so inspiring that the rest of the job was 
I was very motivated to do the rest of the job. Mm -hmm. uh, the music and the musicians motivated me. And I saw they needed not only a record company, but most of them needed a booking agent, a publisher, a publicist, mm -hmm. a radio promotion person. The, the musicians made wonderful music, but they didn't know how to reach the audience. So I've always seen my job at Alligator as being the bridge between the musicians on one side and the potential audience on the other side and bringing them together. The records are part of it, but we're committed to artists' careers, not just to the recordings, but to building their visibility. And, and they're never gonna make a lot of money from record royalties. You know, the blues market isn't that big. Even, even as we expanded it, it, it's not enough so you can live on your royalties for the most part. There are a few musicians, I'm glad to say, who can live on royalties. So building the careers was necessary because they were making most of their money from live performances. You were also producing the, uh, some of those albums. How were um, the, the musicians reacting on your suggestions how to record an album? I well, can imagine that it, some people have a vivid imagination how their music should sound. And then somebody's coming and said, maybe do it another way. Well, I became a producer because I, it was my label and <laughs> there needed to be somebody in charge of the recording. It varied a lot between artists. Okay. Um, with Hound Dog Taylor, for example, I wasn't really a producer so much as I was a recorder. Uh, you know, I was trying to capture what they were doing in the clubs. But even by my third record with Sun Seals, you know, I, I was listening to him and I was saying, this is what makes you original. This is what makes you special. And I was listening to his songs and saying, this is, a, this is an interesting song. This song is more conventional. And we want, we want to go with the interesting songs. And in fact, with, with his record, which is only the third record I did, I suggested a type of an instrumental song to do, which he translated into a, my, he translated my suggestions into a song that he called Hot Sauce, which became a signature song for him, where he played some things, by the way, that I never knew he could play. It was a, a big revelation to me. Uh, and then I realized at the end of the session that we maybe needed one more medium or slow tempo song for variety. And so I suggested that he do a cover song of a Magic Sam song, All Your Love, which all which had been on the radio. So the whole band knew it. And they did it in one or two takes, uh, just, uh, you know, it, it, with, with no rehearsal at all. Uh, Son decided on the key and counted off the song and they began. Other times I've spent a lot of time in rehearsal. And I'm always encouraging artists to write, to make their own original statements, or if they're not really good writers, to take somebody else's song and reimagine it and make it their own. Not try to make a Muddy Water song that sounds like a Muddy Water song, but take his words and his inspiration and make something new. Some of the artists, I, I've produced about a hundred or co-produced about 120 albums over the years, which isn't bad for a guy who can't play music. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I, you know, I really can't play anything, but I've learned a lot from talking with musicians. For the most part, the musicians, because they saw my love of their music and my excitement, and because I was always pushing them to make their own original statements and not to sound like anybody else, uh, for the most part, they responded well. Uh, they didn't respond like I was trying to be their boss, but yeah. more I was trying to be their inspiration. Have you ever um, made any changes in lyrics that you say, we can't record this of, or we, because it has some slur on it? Or uh, That's the great thing about blues I love. There is a lot of innuendo in it. And it's great to figure that out. And sometimes it can to be too straight. I imagine in recording a, a song, sometimes say, we can do this, we can't do this. Well, not so much would I say we can't do this, but... Very often, I, well, very often, sometimes I would say, we need a, a more original rhyme. We need, need a more original idea. We need a more original story. Now, a good example of, of this is, I've been working with Taranzo Cannon, who's one of my current artists. 
Uh, he's has two albums on Alligator, two before that on my old label, Delmark, you know, where I worked, uh, and a self-released record. And as I got to know Toronzo personally, he began bringing his song ideas to me. And I would sit and say, this is interesting, but this one sounds too much like something I've heard before. Or I could see this rhyme. I could understand this rhyme was coming. Yeah, It was not a surprise. <laughs> surprise me. And Toronto began, because I encouraged him so much to surprise me, he began writing more interesting songs and, and some topical songs. Uh, the, the song that we have on the 50th anniversary collection is called The Chicago Way. Now, it's not much so much a topical song as a song about being so proud of being part of Chicago and being a part of the Chicago blues tradition. And he wanted to do uh, a boogie song kind of inspired by Magic Sam. Toronto, he's a, he's a wonderful guy and he loves the fact that he feels as though he is in the line, you know, that over his shoulder he sees you know, Muddy Waters and he sees Holland Wolf and he's trying to carry that tradition forward. He's also writing interesting songs about what's going on in the world today. Songs about life in, in the black ghetto, songs about health insurance, which is a huge problem in the United States, uh, songs about politicians, songs about uh, preachers who, uh, who just want your money and not, not to save <laughs> your soul, uh, songs about uh, undocumented immigrants, which we have many millions of, primarily from, from South and Central America, uh, and songs about domestic abuse, about women whose husbands or, or boyfriends hit them. And, and I encourage these songs because it's not just the old songs of my woman loved me and left me, or I left her, or she came back, or I came back, uh, all of which are good, can be good song subjects. But I like when artists are writing about what's going on in the world now. In the 50 years that you um, worked with a lot of artists, who made the decision to work with them? Uh, probably you, but did some bands, um, what do you call it, um, asked to be on the label with you? Or did you always ask the band to come on and make a record with us? Well, I've been approached by a lot of artists over the years, as you can imagine. I get demo recordings submitted to me all the time. For the most part, uh, I hear musicians who are maybe good, but not, not necessarily great. But the reason I continue to listen to demos is some years ago, I opened a, a package. It was so many years ago that it was a cassette, not, not a yeah, CD. Yeah, yeah. And it was from a band I had never heard of from Sacramento called Little Charlie and the Night Cats. And I love the Beatty. cassette. Yes, and, and Rick Estrin. And I, I went to, to Sacramento to see them, and they were even better live. And, and so they had solicited me, and then I went and heard them and thought, well, this cassette is good, but they can do better than that. They do better than that live. So I became their producer for their first two albums. And then after that, they didn't need me <laughs> because they learned, they learned first, Rick, you know, Rick is a great songwriter, and Charlie was a great guitar player. And they knew what made them original. Uh, you know, Rick always wanted to make his own original statements. And now, of course, Charlie, Charlie retired from the road. And then sadly, he died at, at a young age. But Rick has continued with the band with Kid Anderson on guitar, uh, from originally from Norway, who's a fabulous guitar player. He's crazy like Charlie Beatty, except it's a different crazy. <laughs> you know, he, Charlie Beatty... We had all these influences and mixed them all together. So there was jazz and blues and rock all in, in one song uh, and, and sometimes leaping from one to the other. Kid Anderson, he almost, it's like he, he comes from Mars. I, I, <laughs> uh, you know, his imagination is huge and his, his talent is huge. So he's a perfect foil for, for Rick because Rick is a brilliant songwriter and and harmonica player one of the real great harmonica players and a, and a fun singer he's not he doesn't have the biggest voice in the world but he can tell a story yeah and they, they uh, have so i love that band they have humor and comedy in it yes and not in every song but in no, many but... songs um, you... you know that's one of the things i liked about toronto canon he has a great sense of humor 
Are you saddened by uh, leaving an if, if an artist is left your uh, record company for another, like Rick Astman did, for instance? Well, actually, Rick did. Rick didn't leave us. Oh. The artists who have left us, the artists who left us, were Tinsley Ellis, who came back and then left again and came <laughs> back again. Um, Al Albert Collins, who left to go to Virgin records to a bigger label and didn't actually achieve any more success with them than, than with alligator. But the last time I saw Albert was just before he died. And he said he was still performing. It was, he had been diagnosed with cancer and he said, I really want to come back to alligator. And, and I think he was telling me the truth. And Shamika Copeland left for two albums and found that we gave her much more support than the label she went to. And the Kinsey Report left, but by the time they came back to us, their careers had dropped so much I couldn't revitalize them. Uh, yes, it hurts a lot, uh, especially if I know that I've done, a, and, and my team, because I have 14 people who work for me, my team has done a very good job for, for the artists. And we've advanced the artist's career uh, and the artists, of course, always wonder, could a bigger company, could a richer company do more? And, and that's completely understandable. But they don't understand that for us, it's a passion. And for most other record companies, it's a business. You know, I talk about Alligator and I talk about Alligator as a family. And, and I tell artists sometimes, I remember when the Kinsey Report left and I said, you can leave the label, but you can't leave the family. <laughs> We're well, always your family. For for me, as a blues enthusiastic and a radio host, um, Alligator Records is a sort of a, a, a seed of approval. You know, if if it, it's on Alligator, it's good. And so are a couple of other uh, record companies. We know it must be good. Otherwise, they don't. They will burn. They won't burn their hands on it. You know, and that's well, Alligator. You know, we're, we're thank you. We're we're very particular. Of course, we have lots and lots of musicians to choose from. And, you know, I'm, I feel like if I'm asking somebody to spend an hour listening to music, I'd better make that a very valuable hour. As, as far as the musicians, I tell any musician who comes to Alligator, I want you to come to make the best record of your career. Not just a good record, not just another record, but the one you want to play for your grandchildren and say, that's me, that's my, my apex. And if they don't come with that attitude, I don't want them. Which which artist you regret not signing? <laughs> I had to ask a question. <laughs> no, well, you know, I, I have a book that I uh, was published a couple of years ago called "Bitten by the Blues," where I admit. Yeah, I've my, seen it. My... I, I couldn't read it. Uh, I didn't see it yet, but I, I'm, I'm curious about that. <laughs> well, I think you'll enjoy it because I tried to be a camera. I thought, I'm not so interesting, but people want to read about the kind of person Albert Collins was or the kind of person Coco Taylor was and how they were on the road and in the studio and in, in life. So I tried to be a camera when I wrote the book. Uh, it's not really my story. It's a story of what I've seen. Um, so, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh yeah, the, the artist, I forgot the question for a moment. Um, The two, my two biggest failures or my two biggest uh, mistakes uh, were huge mistakes. Um, in about 1980, I heard a guitar player who I thought was the loudest imitator of Albert King that I had ever heard. I guess who knows and, what going and his to. Name, yeah, his name was Stevie Ray Vaughan. And it took me a few more years before I heard what was special about Stevie. And by then the rest of the world had discovered it. So I had an opportunity to record Stevie and I didn't. Um, and the other artist was an artist where I thought, well, he's really a good musician, but his music is too much R and B and not enough traditional blues. And his name was Robert Cray. And now I hear it and I think, I didn't understand his vision. But at the time I heard it and thought, it's not really blues. Well, it is really blues, but it didn't have blues structures or blues chord changes in the same way. 
uh, you know, is, is what I was used to. So, uh, so those were my biggest omissions. Um, when I did my Living Chicago Blues series way back in 1978, uh, I did six LPs uh, with um, nine artists, uh, three per, per uh, LP. So 18 artists from Chicago who were the best unrecorded or underrecorded artists that I had been hearing because I realized by that time that I was never going to do a full album by every artist that I liked. <laughs> so this was a way to, to show some of these artists off and show the vitality of the Chicago blues scene. And of the artists I recorded, uh, the, the two that were exceptional to me, uh, that made an exceptional impression in the studio were Lonnie Brooks, whom I did sign, Okay. And, and did eight albums with. And the other was Jimmy Johnson, uh, who I consider to be a major league artist. But my, my friends at Delmark were very interested in Jimmy. And I thought, I, I don't know whether I can introduce two new artists new to the world at the same time. So I'll go with, I'll work with Lonnie and I'll let Delmark work with Jimmy. Uh, and Jimmy has turned out to be a you know, very important uh, artists, you know, they say that you can tell the greatest artists in one note. And with Jimmy, whether it's a guitar note or a vocal note, you know it's Jimmy Johnson. So that session he did, if you want to play something a little bit different, that session he did for Living Chicago Blues, which was the first session I did for that series, is one I'm very proud of. Okay, we, I have to check it out because Jimmy Johnson this is kind of a blank spot to me so thank you for that oh well, he, well he's done a number of albums he he hasn't toured as much as some of the other musicians um some years ago he had a a, a wreck when he was traveling with his band okay and he was driving sober he was driving and and he went off the highway and two members of the band were killed oh. uh one of whom was a good friend of mine and it it broke his spirit And he didn't want to be back on the highway driving like most of the most of the blues artists are highway bands, you know, drive 300 miles, set up, play, sleep for a few hours, drive another 300 miles, do the same thing. Jimmy didn't want to do that anymore because his spirit was hurting too much. So he's not as visible as some of the other artists. Yeah, when, if I look through the, the, the complete roster, I guess almost everybody i saw alive a few or not i never saw hound duck taylor live but a lot of them i've happened well to jimmy see. johnson is still performing and i think he's he's 89 or 90 years old <laughs> so and he still sounds great and that's a good thing about the blues he can do it on a very very respectable age and still sound good Well, part of it is the blues is music of real life and real life experiences. So hopefully, if you're a sensitive person, you become your soul becomes deeper as the years pass. Um, in the beginning, you were um, I read you went on with a car fully loaded with an album and then drove to the record now to the radio stations and please play this record and in the hope that they would do it and sell some records. Yes, It's that not... and then I would go from the radio stations to the record distributors. Yeah. So I would try to get the radio airplay first. And it's 50 years later. Now we have um, introduced the internet, uh, streaming. It's a lot different than just selling the albums or the the, 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 the vinyl as maybe it's a little bit coming back. How are you coping with those new challenges? Well, I've always tried to keep up with the technology. So we began with, with vinyl. We made a few eight tracks. We made some <laughs> 45. We made some 45s. We made cassettes. And then as soon as CDs were introduced, we began, we made a commitment to CDs when nobody else in the blues was, was putting out new releases on compact disc. And so okay. we actually dominated the blues compact disc market for one or two years because we, we tried to get our entire catalog on compact disc very quickly. Then of course we had illegal downloading beginning in about 1999 when yeah. people began stealing music on the internet 
Turn and there the was century. a few years that was very painful for big companies and little companies and all the artists because yes, their the, music was the, being the stolen. Napster, the Napster time. And, uh, yeah, the, yeah. And, but then we got iTunes and legal downloads. And I have to say that Apple, you know, which became the dominant force, paid pretty decently. They paid okay for, for both songs and albums. And then came streaming. Now, it's very well known that the streaming services pay tiny amounts of money for, for each stream. So you have to get millions of them, literally millions of them. The bad part is they pay small amounts of money. But the good part is this. All these years, I wanted my music available in some form in places like China and India and the former Soviet Union and Africa and across South America, places where I couldn't get distribution. Now, the entire alligator catalog is on the three biggest streaming services in China. And it's on other streaming services in India and on Apple Music in, in Africa, which is now across all of Africa. It's still a very small amount of money for us, but the possibility for people to discover this music is so great uh, that it was, it was never true before. You know, I'm, I'm a proselytizer. I'm like a man who, ble who believes he has the true religion. And my job is to convert other people to this religion that I believe in so much. So now I have half a world of possible converts who, we, who can become blues fans. And you know, once you get addicted to this music, it's a lifelong addiction. You can't get away from it. The microbe. This is an alarm to remind me that I have uh, another interview yeah. coming up. I asked, pretty quickly. I asked for 30 minutes, but it's never, I will cut it up to a great show. So it's, I could well, talk for a I'm couple of hours. I'm happy, yeah, I, and, and I, you know, we should do that at some time in the future. I'm happy to have you play anything from this collection that you like, uh, but I will say that the, the first, if you have the, the, the 58 songs, uh, the first 18 or so are from the early years of the label. And it's kind of the iconic artists like Hound Dog and Coco and Sun Seals. And the last 18 or so are artists, primarily artists who are with us currently. So That's they're showing the direction the label is going in. So you have, you know, Toronto Cannon and Shemika Copeland. And of course, you have um, Chris Stone Kingfish Ingram, the 22-year-old sensation of the blues. I've seen his him new a couple album, of years but, ago live. Yeah. Well, that was and a he's raw, better now. And that his was new a rough album, diamond then. Yeah, his new album will yeah. be coming um, next month. Yeah, I got. we did the single, and we always spoke to, um, let's see, Selwyn Birchwood, Chris Kane. Oh, yeah, so wonder, wonderful musician. Selwyn is is a great, just a wonderful songwriter I, I, and and writing very interesting songs, and He's pushing the envelope. He's he's <laughs> helping to redefine the blues. Yeah, that's the good thing is we do sometimes live um, recording in our in our show. The band mm -hmm. comes on a Wednesday evening, mostly when they are nothing to do, and then play live for small audience. We record it with six cameras, good audio, and we see how much links that does become through the world. That's only a good thing. That's absolutely Russians, China people, all of the recordings. And yeah. if you if the recording is good, it will sell. And I don't mean the the, the photo cameras with a, with an awful sound. You know, yeah. nobody's going to watch that for you know, for an hour. But if you do it properly, absolutely, is a it's a plus. And that we didn't have that ten years ago. And now, unfortunately, I have to say goodbye because I have to go do another interview. No problem. I think it's you a very pleasure, much. and I look forward. It would be nice to meet in person at some time. I'm uh, there was still. I've been in uh, Chicago. The last time was 2002 at the Blues Festival. So I think it's time for another visit. <laughs> well, you know that we had no Blues Festival last year, and it will be one concert this year, one oh. night. But next year, I, I feel quite sure that we'll have a full festival. I helped to start the Chicago Blues Festival, and I'm very proud of it. You know, of course, it's the biggest blues festival in the world. And this year was going to be a big alligator celebration. And instead, we have one night. <laughs> well, but 
but you know, it's, I'm glad that we're getting over the pandemic and hopefully, you know, if we can, if we can vaccinate the rest of the world uh, and, yeah. and that we can move forward because it's been a, you know, a terrible thing for so many people. Um, you know, obviously all the deaths, but then the musicians have been hurt very much, even more than, yeah, than the record lot. companies. Mr. Yeah. Iglauer, Bruce Iglauer, thank you very much for this small talk, but it is absolutely a three to talk. We're going to make a brilliant show out of it. And I hope to see you next year in Chicago. Okay. And, if, you know, if you want to, if you want to do another Zoom interview at some point in the future, you know, you, you were really well prepared and you asked some interesting questions that other people don't ask. So well, I, I, I did read something. To... I didn't know if you noticed, but I didn't wrote anything down because I want to listen to what you say and then make my own questions. Mm -hmm. And well, sometimes you're... sometimes it's a, it's a good question, sometimes it's stupid, but hey. I've done plenty of stupid things in my life, we learn. don't worry. <laughs> we learn. <laughs> okay, we'll talk again. I th I th I'm, I'm take you up on that one. Okay, thank you. It was a pleasure. I'm, I'm always see that you have... 50 years in front of you where you still want to do that vision of the blues. I hope oh, you can, sure. can live a I, lot I, of them. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm planning for the next 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. It's really okay. Ideal. We'll talk again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.